So having gone through the political, environmental theories, that leaves us with military. Now, normally on the internet, this is sort of the one we associate uh, most with, I don't know how to say it, nationalists maybe, like sort of this sense of the Mongols withdrew, retreated because such and such country was too strong. Resistance was too great. And normally uh, this sort of turns into a lot of people going, ah, something about European heavy cavalry, heavy armor, uh, castles or whatnot. Like that alone was too much for the Mongols. And the Mongols were just so afraid of this that they had to withdraw. Uh, and it's the, the military weakness theory. That's Greg... Regis Rogers, I think he he called he sort of defined it as that too, and essentially the idea being that the Mongols lacked the military capability to conquer Europe, and normally in various YouTube comment sections, this this gets reduced to just oh Europe was so densely populated and so many castles that the Mongols just had no hope of conquering stuff. They could only work in wide open spaces. Too much. Too many forests or cavalry wouldn't be able to maneuver and they'd be picked off. And you'll be surprised to know that a, uh, how should I say this? A modified version of military weakness with a lot of asterisks is actually kind of what's being shown by the historical sources and what Stephen sort of argued for. Uh, but it's sort of military weakness in the very short term and not in the long term without giving too much away. So, Stephen? Yeah. Uh, what you said uh, is very important, that especially in the 1800s, European authors who were, you know, they were in a, uh, a nationalistic competition um, that, you know, France and Germany were competing, and then sometimes it would break into real wars. In this, in this kind of 1800s era, there were these strong nationalist movements <clears throat> and so in countries that had recently asserted their independence like Croatia or you know or were trying to assert their independence they could look back on their history with pride and say you know when the Mongols came it was our sacrifice the Poles for instance you know we turned them them back at Lignitz or an Austrian author could say uh, the Eastern Europeans were overrun, but then finally the Mongols came against the great Duke of Austria, Friedrich, and they turned tail and fled. And this is just how it has been. This is the inheritance of our 20th century historians who were very cynical and skeptical about any kind of idea. <clears throat> they were trying to be dispassionate, unbiased historians in the 20th century, especially the second half. And so anything that smacked of uh, nationalism being driven by a sort of pride, it was dismissed. Uh, and that's where we've been ever since, that the, these serious historians very much doubt, have doubted that European military operations had anything to do with the Mongol withdrawal. That... Essentially, the, the European military effort's almost a, a big nothing. And what's really, the battle that's really going on is the Mongols versus the environment. Or the Mongols versus themselves. There's potential for civil war in politics. Now, despite anything I've said up till now, or we've said, I want to say that I think the political things, the political realities, they played a role in these events. They definitely did. The environment... It could have played a role. It's just I don't think it was the decisive one because it's not showing up in the sources. But what's what gets so often dismissed is the military factor, the the resistance of the locals and the potential for resistance that the Mongols may have perceived. Uh, don't forget, if, if we can overestimate the Mongol ability to conquer everybody, the Mongols in their own time could have overestimated enemies as well. They could have heard about crusades, and I know they did, and if we believe certain authors, the Mongols really overestimated the European ability to wage a crusade successfully without everyone getting scurvy and dying. 
um, or you know, forgetting to bring food and water, and suddenly finding themselves trapped on an island in the Nile River and surrounded. So things like that would happen in real life. But the Mongols still thought the Europeans were formidable. How do I, we know this? We know it because it shows up in the sources, on in the Chinese sources, and the and implied in the Mongolian sources. It shows up in the Persian sources. It shows up across Asia and it shows up in European sources. There's a widespread agreement that, that Europe was going to be a tough nut to crack, even before the Mongols invaded. Even in the secret history of the Mongols, you have uh, Chagtai himself, so Chinggis Khan's second son, and it's sort of, it's portrayed as if he's sort of been gathering intelligence on like the, the western end of the steppe and stuff. And he refers to the people in the far west as they are people with sharp swords and they will fight to the death and these sorts of things. Uh, in uh, Simon of Saint, Simon of Saint Quentin's account of his of the um, of an Dominican embassy to Bajunoyan in the Caucasus in 1248 or so. 1247? Yeah. 1247, 1248. 47, yeah. And he receives his embassy and he sort of reacts with alarm at sort of hearing about um Louis Louis the Ninth's uh, preparations for the uh, the Seventh Crusade. Seventh Crusade. Crusade. And I, I mean it's a reasonable thing. You all of a sudden there's an army showing up and and you uh, react with uh, alarm. But these these are not isolated things. And you're unsure. Uh, the biographies of Subodai Noyan, Subodai Batar, sorry. Uh, so obviously the famous general, the commander of the Mongol army in, in Hungary and stuff. What it's showing is not an absolute walkover in Hungary. What it's showing is uh, the Mongol vanguard getting repulsed on the bridge over the Shio River. What it's showing is Subodai basically needing to whip the princes into shape and shame them into keep pressing on with the campaign. Uh, what's the Armenian... So, Hetham of Coricus. Yes, uh, so he's an Ar Ar a Cilician Armenian who ends up in writing in French or dictating it in French. And what he's reporting is sort of rumors of Mongol defeats in Hungary. Javani and Rashid al Din, same thing, is generally showing a, a difficult course. Uh, Juvani has uh, Batu reacting with concern over the army, over the uh, Hungarian army, uh, needing to ask all the soldiers in his army, including the Muslims, to pray for victory, and sort of things on and on and on like this. Uh, the account of the year and sure and the difficulties on the bridge are actually nicely mirrored by Master Rogers' account and Thomas of Split, where they essentially, they show the same thing. They show this fierce fighting over the bridge. They have the Mongol arm, the Mongol advance force, is forced back. The cro the crossing over to Shio River is essentially botched. And th this is part of the fighting between Subodai and Batu that emerges, is basically each one blaming the other for getting the timing wrong. Subodai is trying to build this pontoon bridge. Uh, the river's quite wide and deep. Uh, there actually was flooding in this case, and so it's a floodplain. And the, the second crossing isn't able to succeed or uh, show up in time. And then when they actually get to the Hungarian camp, you have the, the Knights Templar and the whatever knights under uh, Bela de Force brother Coloman are going out and describe fighting like to the last man or something. And they just, they're putting the Mongols through this whole, all of this trial. It's, the Battle of Muli is not an easy victory. It's an incredibly hard fought thing. And furthermore, it's a hard fought battle after uh, five years of hard fighting across all of Western Asia. The Rus prince of well, was popularly portrayed as just the Mongols went through and they burned everything and killed everything and just had an easy time. And it is true, they burned and killed a lot of things. But there's fierce resistance at some of these Rus cities. Uh, the city of Kozelsk? Yes, there's a Russian city that put up very stiff resistance. That's what you're mentioning, right? several weeks of resistance that Batu was unable to uh, break through initially. There is a battle, a battle with the Rus, which ends up costing the life of one of Chinggis Khan's sons, Kolgan. Yeah, I mean, 
It was a it was a brutal war. I mean, that's one of Chinggis Khan's premier sons. Now, granted, mm-hmm. Colgan's not one of the four sons of Berta. Yeah, yeah, who are the going to inherit the throne? But he was the next one of all his non uh, dynastic sons. The the first ranking, middle ranking son. Yes, he was the. He's as high as any of those and as premier as any of them ever got. And yet he died in combat not far from Moscow on the mm-hmm. Oka River, uh, according to the very reliable Mongol reports. It's a very yeah. dry report, but think of the impact of that. This is Chinggis Khan's own son. Um, but let's assume, you know, now that Chinggis Khan has become this very revered... Uh, ancestor figure to have one of his sons die in combat it's, it's, must have been quite a psychological shock to the conquerors and what you might get an idea from this map here and of course first of all this is not listing every single city that the mongols or site the mongols attacked it's a single lot of them but you have to imagine this is by the time they get to hungary they've been on campaign five six years They've traveled thousands of kilometers and they fought potentially hundreds of battles, you know, because there's how many minor skirmishes and things. And uh, in the in the southern steppe here in the Caucasus, we don't we don't have very good coverage from the sources. So we don't really know sort of the specifically how many battles are being fought or what battles in the steppes between Kiptrak forces and and the like. We we know some, we don't know. We know all of them. So even if the Mongols are winning every battle, and I think they more or less do win every single battle, recorded battle of the this part of that campaign, um, you're going to suffer losses. Men get injured, horses get injured. Men, you're, I mean, you're sitting on a horse for essentially five years straight doing nothing but fighting. At the very least, you know, there's going to be some guys with some sprained shoulders or, uh, you know, just just day-to-day wear on your body like that, let alone the wear from being in battle. And a lot of these battles are sieges. And we know, uh, again, I think it's Kozelsk, where uh, there's like a sally by uh, the, the garrison and the sons of the the commanders in that Mongol army get killed in the garrison, and there's so many bodies that they can't even find these commander's sons anymore. Um, there was enough bodies that there was a very profitable trade in transporting these bodies back to Mongolia for a large cemetery for those killed on the campaign. Uh, John, is it Plano Carpini or Rubric who accidentally... Yeah, and so... During his uh, embassy into Mongolia, he accidentally wanders into this ceremony and just about gets uh, beaten by the guards until he explains that he's just he was an embassy and he didn't know any better. Uh, it's while it's very popular to show this as just an absolute walk in the park for the Mongols, there isn't really a military campaign that is a walk in the park in sort of that kind of easy sense. It's still a lot of work. They're still losing men and stuff. And by the time you get to Kiev, um, 1240 or so, part of the army leaves. Uh, this is a Guyuk and Mönk, so two, two of the senior princes of the army, two of the senior princes of the empire leave. And I think, do some princes accompany them too, or just is it just the two of them? Only the two of them are really mentioned prominently, but uh, I believe other princes must Probably. have accompanied them. This guy's who, part of their party, presumably. Yeah. Uh, so they leave. And these, are, these princes, they're not going by themselves. They're going with their guards. They're probably going with whatever contingents they commanded. So what's the, the common rule of thumb is that every named commander has like a Tumen or something. So let's, at the end... You know, let's assume these, even if these are both half strength forces, let's assume only 5,000 men in each tumen, which it seems to be kind of the regular size tumens ended up being. Uh, that's 10,000 
men of the army just left. Now, they've been suffering losses all the way. They've been suffering. There's Some are going to have to be left back to hold certain certain points, garrison certain regions in this step, and uh, ma maintain these routes of communication, uh, maintain any lengthy sieges, say the Caucasus, for example, where access was quite difficult. The rough estimate for the army at the start of the campaign is usually about 100, 130,000 men. Uh, by the time you get to Hungary, uh, winter 1240, you might be, let's say, 60,000 men for sake of argument. And then this is a force that then gets split up further to go into Poland, Hungary, uh, several routes into Hungary. So you don't have more than, say, 20,000 Mongol troops in a given front. They are not bringing this massive superiority to all of these engagements. There's, I think, there's a sense that the Battle of Muhi is actually fought before the Mongol plan it actually uh, gets fully into place. They invade Hungary from several routes, so you end up with four or five distinct armies uh, marching into Hungary through various passes in the Carpathians. And it seems like probably the plan was they'd all sort of surround the Hungarian main army. But the Hungarian main army actually leaves Pest sooner than the Mongols are expecting. They pursue uh, Shiban's troops back to the Shio River and then refuse to cross the river and kind of muck up whatever plan Subutai or Batu kind of had there. But also now Subutai and Batu with 10 to 20,000 men are now facing the entirety of the Hungarian army, not really in the uh, uh, conditions they had planned. It's, it's a really important point you brought up if you look at this map by the time they've reached kiev it, the mongols have covered thousands of kilometers battled such warlike people as the alans the ossetians the asut as the mongolians called them the bulgars these guys were no joke according to friar julian who saw their armies they could field fifty thousand horsemen the rus principalities Nobody has ever found invading Russia in the winter a good idea. Or, no, they've done it, but it hasn't worked out. Uh, except the Mongols, really. There might be a few other examples that in obscure chronicles, but this, this is the only really big one I know of where a winter invasion of Russia worked out. Um, and yet, it was brutal fighting one city after another. Personal combat by Guyuk. In, against the Alans and their city of Magas that we see at the in the Caucasus Mountains. But uh, Munka, who also later became Khan, displayed valor at Riazan. Personally, he was in the he was in the combat, fighting hand hand to hand, according to the sources we have. So they must have been really worn out by the time this big five-pronged invasion of Hungary happens. And we have to realize that Hungary was much bigger back then than it is now. It's this, pretty much this whole Carpathian Basin all the way to the Adriatic Sea in Croatia and Dalmatia. But, so this was a big massive operation stretching from Poland all the way to Romania today. But uh, what I think explains uh, the Battle of Muhi being left to Batu and his brother Shiban and Subutai and why these others might not have helped is because they had their own problems fighting these other major armies simultaneously. And also that might be related to the fact that this territory is going to be divided. And the Mongols believe it's a wealthy kingdom. They've heard things to this effect. It's, go it's got to be divided at least with some kind of semblance of fairness. You can't imagine that uh, one of the sons of Tului, Bocek, Bocek, would go and invade and risk his life, and then at the end of this invasion he just hands it all over to Batu. That's not really how the Mongols worked. There had to be some kind of division no. amongst... Well, they call, so that's, so that's um, uh, in the Mongol Empire, it's the idea is that this is all the shared property of the house of Chinggis Khan. So wherever you fight, that family gets uh, Inju lands. So in the case of the Jochids, the Golden Horde, uh, 
territories Jochi had attacked in China, for example, they could keep claiming um, revenues and taxes from that and continue to do so basically up until the fall of the Yuan Dynasty. So it's a similar idea here. Probably initially, all of the you have all the branches of the family fighting here in what's now Russia, Eastern Europe, Kazakhstan, whatever. So where Guyuk's fighting, he's probably imagining, okay, the cities I conquered, these will now be Inju, they will be revenue for the line of Ogodai. And likewise, where the sons of Joshi fight, they think this will be for the Joshids, sons of uh, sons of Tolui, same thing, sons of Chaktai, they're all represented here. And probably, and I think you highlighted this in your dissertation, some of the infighting we see at the command level probably comes from the fact, or a sense from some of these princes are going, well, what am I getting out of this? Am I and the members of my lineage fighting and dying so all these cities can go to the Jochens? You, you have to think that must have been a big part of this. Because we like to imagine that maybe some bigger thing was happening, that there's no, the Mongol ideology of world conquest is so deep and so thoroughly ingrained in people that they're self-sacrificing. Well, that might work at the commoner level, and that might work on a lot of people, but up at this level of the princes, you can bet there's arguments about division of mm -hmm. spoils and yeah. how things are going to be divided and who gets what. Well, and we know this happened because Rogaria says after the Battle of Muhi, they start to arrange the distribution of the territory amongst mm -hmm. the the nobles of the Mongols. Yeah, and this is uh, it's, we see this in all of the uh, like campaigns all over the empire. Uh, when Hulugu and his army marches to complete the conquest of Iran, Baghdad, and such in the 1250s, there's Jochid troops sent to that army to confirm Jochid Injulans. And part of the reason for the war between um, Berka and Hulugu Han is that Berka, as a son of Jochi, was under the impression that Baghdad was kind of his territories, would be uh, should have been, as part of Western Asia, should belong to the Joshids. And when Hulugu sacks the city without consulting him, and then without giving him any in the loot, that is, in Berka's view, a misuse of the empire. And the same sort of factors are going to be at play, play that's here. That's a really good point. Berka is a very good illustration. He's a, bro a younger brother of Batu, and uh, Simon of St. Quentin, I believe, a um, uh, European writer from the time, mentions that Berka was taken off of this really lucrative route that traders and emissaries would use to go to Batu. And Batu had him removed off of that route and moved into the kind of... Oh, that's a little Rubruk. Rubruk says that. Oh, Rubruk. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, but yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and uh, Rubruk William of Rubruk in the 1250s describes Batu Han uh, moving Berka off of these... Uh, in the steppe north of the Caucasus because Berka was taking all the gifts from Muslim traders and so instead sent Berka um, sort of n northwest of the Caspian uh, Sea, I think sort of towards the Ural River. Yeah, and an emissary who was passing through was expected to have gifts for everybody along the route, all the magnates, all the commanders of 10,000, the Noyans, all the princes. But who got the lion's share of these gifts depended on geography a lot of the time. And so Batu removed Berka, and of course Berka must have been enraged about that. So these guys are not above mundane concerns about wealth and property. And uh, in fact, they care a lot about those things. And I think some of the tensions that show up between the princes, a lot of the princes seem to hate Batu. In the secret history, they finally have this explosive argument with him. And I'm sure a, a lot of modern historians would just think, it, oh, well, it's a personality conflict, or it's about lineage or something. Well, it could have been about resources. Could have they, they get mad that Batu drank first, and that's a little bit telling about, does he also drink first from the, the loot, as it were? Does he also drink first from the land that they conquer? It's that it's he's not sharing. You know, he's, he's in this for himself. Well, you can imagine that those kind of tensions are starting to build 
as this war gets harder and harder. <laughs> or, or they realize it's not going to be an easy victory. It's brutal. It's dragging on year after year. Everyone in this region seems to want to go down fighting. They don't want to just surrender right away. They're, they're warlike. And so there's no... They're not even negotiating. Well, when the Mongols came to Riazan, they said, we just want a tenth of everything. That's our policy. And the Russians replied, well, sure, you, you can have that tenth when all of us are dead. <laughs> well, and they, and that's very they, In Hungary, too, so they send, actually, interestingly enough, an Englishman as a uh, envoy, captured Englishman. And there's... This might be in Matthew Paris or something. There's a reference to something that the Mongols had sent him or other embassies uh, some, I think, 30-something times to Bela IV. Um, sort of the, this idea that they keep like, come on, surrender, 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 surrender. And I know the popular is they are pursuing the Cumans in there and the... Uh, and that's why they attacked Hungary for harboring their prisoners. And I'm sure to an extent that probably was um, a factor. But normally what we see when the Mongols sort of get up to powers who they aren't actively fighting with, uh, for example, in northern India with the Delhi Sultanate, the Mongols are generally more interested in getting a sort of nominal submission, some sort of tr tribute delivery or something, rather than start a whole new war on top of the war they're actually going. And that's one of the theories around why Chinggis Khan himself did not invade India is that the Delhi Sultan at the time, El Tutmish, uh, delivered sort of a trip. He sent some tribute. He sort of um, paid off Chinggis Khan in effect. Think of the Pope and Attila the Hun. And even the King of France, uh, Louis the St. Louis, Louis the Ninth, he sent uh, some emissaries with a church service, sort of materials to hold a nice church service because he heard that the Mongols might be, well, Christian. Guyat Khan might be Christian. And so they arrived with the fancy treasures and the uh, Guyat Khan's widow immediately you know, took possession of them and showed all these gathered emissaries from all over Asia the treasures and she, and she said, hey look, the King of France just submitted to us. and. King Louis, when he heard this, deeply regretted ever contacting them. This is also a great point, too, because although we have tons of examples of the Mongols forcing submission through military efforts and stuff, they much preferred if you just submitted on your own. That's so much easier for them. They don't want to have to expand the troops, the resources, and all this stuff to focus on conquering you. So lots, there's lots of people to be conquered. You have to conquer. It's better if you just submit, because then they don't destroy all of your resources. They don't destroy all your farmland. You can just submit, start paying taxes. That's what the Mongols are happiest with. Uh, it seems the Caliph in Baghdad, Anuchukka, was to some extent paying some sort of tribute in Karakoram. And part of the reason for the Mong like when we see uh, Menk's orders to Hulugu and Rashid al Din, it says, like, see if the Caliph will come out and like resume relations. And if he doesn't, then you attack. And same with the the uh, the Nisari Ismailis, the assassins, and you know, sort of other... And anyone who doesn't immediately get attacked by the Mongols, it's like, okay, they paid them off in some, in some fashion. Okay, so the Mongols have campaigning for five straight years to cover thousands of kilometers, many, many, many battles. They're, men get lost, men get sick. These, this is just going to be a part of war. So you kind of have to imagine like the Mongols threw this, like this spear they threw across Asia and yeah, it's going through everything, but every time it goes through, there's little bits of the spear are breaking off. You know, so it's still a very sharp spear, but it's not as sharp as it was before. There's also a trend I'd like to highlight too. So what we see in the attacks in the Rus principalities every year is that the fighting begins in the fall and winter and then in the spring they start to withdraw so that they can rest their horses in the steppe in the summer uh, and this is that's a pretty regular feature of mongol 
uh, maneuvers, especially in the length of your campaigns. In the wars in China, this is employed a lot. So winter, winter and fall, always the preferred season for the Mongols for going on campaign. Or sort of the campaign starts end of summer, start of the fall, and is already underway by winter. You aren't traveling in the winter. You're already fighting once winter starts. Uh, that's kind of the distinction there. And then come the spring, you start to withdraw, return to the steppe, because you, you have to just rest troops, give them a chance to to breathe, essentially. It's sort of, think in the First World War, the, the troops in the trenches, and they have like their shift, and they get, you'd spend however, I don't know, like a week at the front line, and then you get like two weeks behind the lines, whatever. It's, I, I think of it the same kind of idea. And it's a chance for you know, ho- horses to get their weight back up and sort of men to take stock and heal from injuries and and things like this. This happens very consistently because it's consistently, and it's also a chance to sort of re-strategize, get new information, and make a new uh, plan of attack. This is Subodai does this himself during the end of the war of the Jin Dynasty that started the twelve thirties. Um, now he's not in overall command. But he's part of the army, which is they'd attack, they'd struggle to get past uh, the, the fortress of Tongguan, for example. Subodai suffers a defeat near it, actually. So they retreat for the summer and again make a new strategy, and then in the fall you start again. And for nomads, fall's the best time to make an attack because that's when all the the harvests have come in. Or they're in the process of uh, bringing in their harvest. So not only are you going to disrupt the food supplies of this community, but you also can just take them for yourself. Again, this is what happens every year through the Rus principalities, the fightings in the winter, and you retreat to the steppes in, in the summer. Now, I've kind of always suspected, and uh, not always, when I read Stephen's theory for the first time, that when they get the hungry, the retreat, the withdrawal, begins in the same kind of idea. It's that, okay, this isn't going well. Let's fall back to the step and sort of rest men and horses and, and come up with new plans. Uh, get maybe get reinforcements or something. And then they learn of organized death and rebellion there and don't end up coming back immediately. An important point is that they, when they left, when they start leaving Europe... They don't know, well, let's say when they evacuate Hungary, they don't know that the Khan is dead. And uh, their own report, translated by Rashid ad din and included in his Persian Chronicle, written around 1300, but it's definitely a Mongolian original report, says that when they turned back, the Mongols didn't know that the Khan was dead. So that's also evidence for that um, point of view, that they, they didn't receive that information yet. But something that gets overlooked, and so if we if we take a look at this map here, um, I'm trying to draw attention to the fact that the Mongols, when they leave, you can see these red and yellow lines, and they're in the Carpathian Basin, which is this sort of boomerang shape of mountains, or you could say I don't I don't know what kind of shape a liver looks like a liver. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and inside of that is that's the heart of the Hungarian kingdom and these mountains sort of protected it We can see the Mongols have overcome the mountains from different sides and they've run into the heart of Hungary up to the Pest up to the Danube River and they even cross the river, but then they evacuate in two groups at least two groups that we know of and They make their way down to Bulgaria and that's southwest. That's not a direct rush back to the steppes at all. This is a movement towards... Uh, this is trivia for all, all the listeners um, or viewers. What, what famous medieval metropolis was very close to Bulgaria? And you probably guessed it. Constantinople was there. So I think they were going down... It looks like they may have been considering a run at... Constantinople, which was ruled at the time by the Latin Empire, 
And there's a whole bunch of sources that are just fragmentary, because the Latin Empire, sadly, we don't have any chronicles or histories from it written by its own authors that have ever survived, and not much from Bulgaria either has uh, survived from this time. But there's little pieces of information, and there's um, archaeological evidence that the Bulgarians and Latins both fought back when the Mongols came. The Latins supposedly won a battle, um, and then lost the next one to the Mongols. But either way, their emperor was away from the city of Constantinople for a long time. He was on this front line fighting the Mongols. We know that from the sources. And so again, this doesn't look like Batu's running back home. He just got news that Ogadai died. He's got to get out. It looks more like they've kind of... Like a bear that's... That's tried to... I, I don't know if nature metaphors are useful, but like... An animal that has moved in on prey or something, and then has found that the prey... Is resisting more strongly than they thought, so they just kind of tire of it. <laughs> They've now they're moving on for another target, and I think your what you said is correct that you know they saunter out of out of Europe and they go along and they even attack tribes in in the southern Caucasus around 1243-42, They attack people in the in the Caucasus region, and then finally they end up at the Volga River. And they hold, apparently, this meeting on the Volga River in 1244. So they, they seem like they're just sort of sauntering back out of Europe. They're not in a big rush. They didn't get information that has them running in a beeline back to Mongolia. This is... Master Roger, so again, the, the fellow who is with the Mongol army at this point, a Hungarian, uh, what he describes is a almost leisurely... Uh, route back out because and they're being very thorough sacking every place they didn't sack in the first pass basically turning over all the stones they didn't turn over the first time again they're not rushing out they're not out in a panic they're not we have to get back and do something we have to they're not it's not a response to some news it's it's a considered and thought out decision and the army is still in good order it's not a it's not a route it's not a panicking retreat it it's a, again, a strategic withdrawal and it's almost like they're just searching for plunder at this point yeah. after winter 1242 they're just looking for vulnerable places i suppose now we've sort of highlighted a couple trends here so the the trouble of a lengthy campaign fall fall back in the summer to rest men and horses Maybe get get new intelligence, whatever. I guess the question remains is, though, and you can answer this, Stephen, is there sort of a specific point then in Western Hungary, once they cross the Danube, when the Mongols essentially go, this is a little too annoying. What you should then think about is if you want to make sense of, okay, why are they now... Why are the Mongols now veering southwest into the Balkans? Why are they now going back to the steppes? Uh, what what happened immediately before that? And then I guess we should consider their farthest advance westward, which would be western Hungary, what they call Transdanubia. They'd crossed the river around January, from Christmas Day to mid-January um, 1242. And now they're in the heartland, what they called the, the medium regni of Hungary. This is the heartland, and this is the place with the most wealth. Hungary didn't have huge cities, but the cities it did have that were big were in this place, and the Mongols are now in that place. And they suddenly, they, they attack a bunch of fortresses. And we have a letter from the Hungarian defenders to the Pope at this time, February 1242. And they said, when the Mongols crossed over the river, we all fell back in good order into our for planned fortifications. And all these fortresses and monasteries and castles are, that are still holding out are holding out really well against the Mongols. And we're, we're not worried about their attacks, but we're worried about getting no help. Um, and I think they were worried about their attacks, but there's a bit of confidence in the Hungarian voice here that might not just be uh, bluff. 
when they're talking to the Pope because they want help. I think they've, but they've upped the defenses and the defenses are better in that part of the country. And suddenly Mongol sieges are not going very well. And this, uh, they attack three major sites in Hungary, Sekish Fervar, Pannon Helma, and Estergom Citadel, and they're repelled in all three cases. But these other fortresses we don't hear about, or we only have little bits of information, the Mongols also were losing there. Like in Slovakia, Trenčín, they failed to take Trenčín, Nitra, they failed to take Bratislava, they didn't take uh, almost any anything in Croatia. So they chase the King of Hungary down into Croatia now, and they attack uh, Klis Fortress, they threaten Sp Split, Spolato, they threaten Tra Trogir, which is called Trau today, where the... Uh, or wait, no, it's called Trogir today, um, and Trau and ancient sources, but uh, that's where the king was hiding. None of these places, they had old stone Roman fortifications that had been turned into medieval fortresses and, uh, and walls, and um, the Mongol sieges are not going well. And there's a lot of improvised fortresses. So long story short, I think these uh, tougher fortifications that start to occur in Transdanubia, in Austria, in Croatia, in Western Poland, very Western Poland, Silesia, in Bohemia, a few places in Moravia, this is modern Czech Republic, and in Slovakia. The Mongols must not be liking these experiences, because these these little fortresses all over the place, full of troops and and loot, but you can't get at it. And the, the people, the local people are taking the loot into these things beforehand. And then in the eventuality that a place does fall to the Mongols, in one famous case, the capital of Hungary, the local people burned all their valuable property before the Mongols could get in and seize all the fabric. And the fabric was a European commodity that Mongols wanted because it's hard to manufacture your own fabrics on the steppe, clothing. So that was very valuable to them. Uh, and the, the European defenders torched all the... Because they knew they were going to die anyway. The Mongol reputation had sort of preceded them for killing the, the, the city dwellers that they didn't need. Um, so the, the military experience starts to get really negative at the westernmost advance of the Mongols. Suppose it's useful then to say what specific change in the fortification design occurs west of the Danube that is not present east of the Danube. That would cause this. It's uh, stone fortifications, broadly, you could say. Mm -hmm. So yes. and this is what we see in, I believe it's Master Roger's account again. I, mean, I know we keep referring to him, but he is basically one of one of, if not the most important single source on the uh, on the invasion in Hungary. So in what he describes that the sites is so uh, in Estergom's case. So you have the fortified keep, the citadel in the city, and then you have sort of the suburbs around it and maybe lower wooden walls or, or no walls in, uh, in the case of Pest, for example. They don't start building ditches basically until a, a couple days before the Mongols show up, and it doesn't turn out great for them. Uh, but at Estragon, what Master Roger describes is essentially, uh, he describes Batu and the army just essentially annihilating the entire city except for the stone keep. That the this main center, this main fortified uh, stone building built up high, on an outcropping, essentially stands defined com compared to the rest of the city. Yeah, Batu actually orders the execution of some women there. He becomes so frustrated that these women that normally get spared, he orders them executed, and sp specifically because he lost the loot that was um, the capital of Hungary. Uh, they're not getting the rewards they wanted. They're getting frustrated. Suddenly this war isn't as fun. When you're, not, when you're not just trouncing your opponents, it's not fun at all to conquer the world, uh, apparently. Especially after six years of it. 
fatigue setting in. And they must, and then keep in mind, you know, context, right behind Hungary is the Holy Roman Empire, and then France. And then you've got England, and you've got Italy with its various powers, and none of this, and the Latin Empire still hasn't been knocked out of the war. The Serbians are still there. There's a, the Poles are intact. They've been mauled, but they're still intact. The Kingdom of Bohemia is right there. Uh, so this is not, this is not going to end the war. Taking Estragom is not going to end the war and bring the whole fold of Europe into submission to the Great Khan. They're, and they are potentially facing their own annihilation. They know about Crusades probably by now. They know that a crusade's forming in Germany. They don't know that it's run by a bunch of corrupt and incompetent people who are going to ultimately pilfer the yeah. funds. And the breaks up. So the crusade, it's underneath uh, Friedrich uh, Hohenstauf and his, his son. And I think the crusade doesn't even doesn't even get to like the border of the Holy Roman Empire before it just falls apart and they start fighting each other and there's a civil war. But but we know that uh, the Austrian duke had also, you know, he was also part of these attacks on the Mongols that were coordinated. There were princes from, at least their contingents must have been operating together. Mm -hmm. The king of Bohemia. Well, if you're, if you're in the Mongols' position, what you are seeing in the spring of 1242 is that you have these fortified um, stone keeps, which are at that moment proving or that you the style of catapults they're using there these chinese traction catapults are proving insufficient to puncture those walls or to puncture them in in good time or they're struggling to meet at, at these high built on top of out, these rocky outcroppings they're struggling to make the angle on these because most of where they've been fighting in roofs and china and such thing the, these cities these fortifications, they are built around settlements, and settlements generally are built at low points along rivers, in flat areas. It's easy to get your angle on, on these things, to pound, to just pound the walls relentlessly. When you get to these high up mountain or anything built on any hills, outcroppings and stuff, immediately is becoming much more difficult for these catapults to hit. I mean, we, and this isn't isolated in Europe, when we see, for example, in these assassin fortresses in northern Iran, one of these holds out for 15 years against the Mongols. And the, the reason the Mongols are able to take most of the assassin fortresses is they basically force the submission of the leader of the Nisari Ismailis and make him convince everyone to submit and then demolish the fortifications afterwards. There's not actually a siege of most of the sites except for um, a handful of them. And that's a funny thing because when the gamers um, who take a strong interest in these things or the people with a, you know, a lot of people with a, like a casual interest, let's say, I shouldn't say gamers, but you, people who've, who've picked up some knowledge about the Mongols and they, they love the story of this conquest. But when you're at, when they consider why Europe didn't fall, they say, well, I don't think these castles could have been an issue because the Mongols conquered the Ismaili assassins. But the devil's in the details that the Ismaili assassins were duped into surrendering their ruler to the Mongols, and then he was used as a hostage to get all the castles to surrender. Anyways, again, what we said before, the Mongols, they prefer to have you submit without a fight than actually have to fight you. And it's its not because they don't think they can win, it's they don't want to put in the resources to have to fight every single little city. This is part of the reason for the massacres and why the Mongols themselves love to play up and brag about the massacres is because if you're convinced that fighting the Mongols will result in certain death, not just of yourself and your family, but everyone in your community and your city, then the stakes are too high. If the, the point of a siege, like in, in general, is that you are convinced you can hold out. And that you cannot face this guy in the field, but this guy does not have the resources or the capability to fight off the siege and or to to besiege you and be successful and move on. It's it's very labor intensive, time intensive, resource intensive. It's but if you are under the sincere belief 
this guy's going to win no matter what. And we see the same thing with the Romans. That the belief in the besiegers' search and victory is as powerful a tool as anything. And that's much of what uh, ancient and medieval warfare is, is someone playing up the reputation. That's the whole reason everyone thinks the Spartans were so were so great is because they had the great prop, or PR guys. Yeah, you can you can picture how this works in a medieval setting, like uh, the the feeling of dread that would set in to go to your ancient Greek analogy when you hear like you thought this contingent was the Thebans, and then it's like no, it's actually fifty percent Spartan. You can just picture the dread, like oh no, oh, we didn't know those guys were like it's that same idea. The Mongols were had a reputation and they cultivated it. They hung certain bodies upside down in the in the Caucasus region in the city of Durbent or places like this they they hung a dead guy up to represent a thousand killed so that you'd see a whole bunch of them hanging and you'd, and you'd know each one of these represents a thousand and they were trying to terrify people and it really almost worked in Europe at least against the Hungarians the king of Hungary was so scared of of them that he uh, had a, a huge explosive tantrum in the city of Spalato when he arrived and they didn't have a ship ready for him to take off in case because he didn't he didn't believe these great fortifications stone state-of-the-art made from old Roman ruins he didn't think they they could hold out and um, a person who was in that area Thomas of Spalato said that local people were confident to resist the Mongols when they appeared but the Hungarian refugees who'd fled to Croatia and were staying with them were so terrified at that, that when they realized it was the Tatars who had arrived that it demoralized everyone in the city because the Hungarians were saying it doesn't matter what your fortifications are like they're going to make a ramp that goes right over top of your wall you can't do anything against them and it was a, a kind of obnoxious for the local people because <laughs> it's like well first of all you, you brought these guys here and now you're telling us nothing resistance is futile but it was the it was the terror that the Mongols really had generated in. So it was almost effective, but there were too many people around. There's just a lot of people, and then none of them are going to, not a lot of them are going to go down without a fight. Yeah. Now, of course, we're not saying that all in all the Mongol reputation is just PR and stuff because they were very good at sieges. You kind of have to be that in order to get the reputation uh, going. It's not just paid a bunch of guys to say good things about them. I think there's a sense, too, when the Mongols, they cannot cross the Danube in the uh, first part of 1241. They have to wait till the river freezes. And it's so there's a, a, a lengthy defense of the Danube is presented and the Hungarians are like trying to break the ice before the Mongols can cross. And because they don't want them to cross. But you kind of get a sense in these couple months that get bought uh, that they're able to sort of in improve some of the defenses, improve some of their techniques, bring in guy, what, whatever, and get sort of like, okay, everyone get serious about, about defending this settlement. That the, the Hungarians were really taken aback by the ferocity of the attack in the first half. And what the Mongols love to do is isolate communities. And they have their, their Nerga, for example, and they, they drive, they'll surround a certain point and drive all the refugees in and they'll have their, Fain retreats and all, all there's a whole playbook of ploys that they'll love that they'll they employ consistently and they and they do this very effectively in eastern Hungary and in in the west western part of the kingdom I guess they sort of over that winter of 1241 they get a chance to sort of they've experienced the ploys they're getting news from refugees and they're sort of I wonder if there's sort of like a, a doctrine of defense gets like put out by the knowledgeable people okay here here's what we should not do here's kind of what we should be planning on and it's still even with all of that it's still very destructive when they get to western hungary there's still like i said all these suburb any place that's unfortified that is not surrounded by uh these stone walls is burnt down and destroyed it's not well just as you're saying it's not a walk in the park for the Mongols through all this sage, it's definitely not a walk in the park for the Hungarians on the receiving end of it in Eastern Hungary. And just now, uh, 
archaeology is revealing the extent of a improvised fortifications, just earthworks that the local villagers would do. They'd get together, many different villages would come together in this emergency as the Mongols invaded, and they knew they couldn't count on the royal forces anymore. The king had been defeated, had fled across, you know, to Austria. The other king, his brother, Kalman, had been mortally wounded. The royal army is essentially decimated at the Battle of Muhi and in the with, with retreat, panicky retreat after. These people are on their own in the eastern part of Hungary on the Great Hungarian Plain. But they didn't just sit there and die. Some of them did. You know, you can find them. <laughs> uh, but a whole lot of them gathered in center points around a church, usually. And they made circular ditches and rows of them. So maybe two or three, at least. Uh, and they used to think these were cemeteries. That's why people were thrown off. Even though, you know, our, our eyewitness, Rogarius, Master Roger, tells us that people were doing this, gathering around a church from many villages and fighting to the death. Now they're finding them all. So hilariously, for a long time, archaeologists just thought these circular rings around the churches were old medieval cemeteries, but then they started finding guys with arrows in them, and they all had 1241 coins in their boot or whatever, and they've got weapons, and they're in various scenes of combat and dismemberment, and they started to realize, oh, this isn't a cemetery, this is a last stand. This is Custer's last stand over and over again, but they, they thought, okay, they found some examples. Now they're realizing this was systematic. The Mongols were fighting, you know, they'd fight to one of these and then they'd go 30 kilometers and it's another battle to the death. Uh, and so it shouldn't really surprise us that they had a special cemetery for Mongols who died in Hungary, in Mongolia, because probably a lot of them die overrunning these trench work. Yeah. And we shouldn't like dismiss a ditch as like, oh, they made a ditch. This is a, how, how inept these were. Like a ditch sort of the like kind of those ancient basic tools of siege warfare uh, of defense and the reason it's used even in modern warfare is it's it's a simple and effective sort of defense it's right right away it's just stopping anyone from just riding their horses right up and taking advantage of you it's just a ditch it has to be filled in or they have to push through uh the gateway which is going to be fortified in some fashion and when we see in master roger's account is what they're employing to attack and actually take many of these settlements is is their tricks at first. Is they're, they're tricking the Hungarians into thinking they're going to be attacking from, uh, for sake of argument, the east side, and then the Mongol, the rest of the troops were in hiding, and they come around, they attack from the west side, and now attack from the now unguarded point, or they'll they'll bypass a settlement. The settlement thinks the Mongols have left, and then once their guards let down, the Mongols come running back and kill everyone who's come out of hiding. And things like that. that, And that's what they prefer is taking everyone off guard and uh, surprising them. And again, they don't want to face active resistance all of the way. They just, they have not brought the numbers for that. There's no, and I know sometimes this is sort of that, I think this is more so that Russian popular cultures that the Rus are sort of like this Thermopylae kind of thing where the Rus were all brave warriors and they were just overwhelmed by sheer numbers of Mongols. Well, they weren't, the, the army itself is very large, but it's never operating in one place. It's like all of these little units all over the place and they don't want to have to face constant resistance for every single step of the way. No, it, it's kind of funny. Uh, world to think of this like World War I in any way would seem, at first, on the surface, this war must seem like it's a totally different world. It's a highly mobile war, whereas World War I is this trench warfare. But shockingly, the war in Hungary had an element of trench warfare and slow gains and... You know. With this in mind, when the Mongols withdraw in 1242, they're think, thinking, okay, we're not having great success taking these these citadels, these uh, stone keeps. Uh, we, we're only, the expectation is there's only more of this the further west you go. And what they're hearing is that the Holy Roman Emperor is uh, putting together this huge crusading army. And of course, they don't know the actual details that it's going to fall apart. 
They don't know and that there's yet. there's a, a 500 year old wizard oh. named named Papa, <laughs> the great pope, the <laughs> and he's o- he's overseeing everything, and everyone's loyal to him. Mm-hmm. So you know, the, if they, they over they would have overestimated the yeah, it's, possible danger, and that's what's always been the suggestion or everyone always makes a suggestion that when the mongols go into poland at the same time that they go into hungary that part of this is a maneuver to prevent the polish princes from providing troops to assist the hungarians now whether such a thing would actually have occurred is doubtful it's hard to say it's unlikely that the polish army would have been able to any polish army because it's not like a state of poland it's five duchies would have been able it's it's doubtful such an army would have been able to get organized and make it to Hungary. But the Mongols, they tend to think everyone does warfare like them. So what would they do? Well they would have sent a sort of flanking force like that. So they again they overestimate the offensive capabilities of these European armies. And they're assuming, okay, we don't want to get trapped. All of their the whole Western campaign is like a whole army of like pincer movements preventing anyone from linking up and joining them when this army is moving in the western steppe there's also an army under Tromohunoyan which is moving through northern Iran and the Caucasus and into Anatolia securing that flank too and then same thing was repeated on smaller and smaller scale in in the Rus principalities and into Europe so they're always overestimating them and so when they just get they're just getting like rumors from their spies, embassies, whatever, of this huge army in, in Germany, of all these castles and things. Again, their troops have spent all these years on campaign. They've been suffering losses, and now they're only being promised no easy victories, just more fighting for every scrap and scrap of land. In this case, the Mongol withdrawal is not because of environment or mud or because they've lost or because of organized death, but essentially going as like a strategic move, looking at it and going, if we keep fighting, we will just eventually ground our army into dust. We've only, they've only been in Hungary about a year. There's, they don't conquer anything in less than a year. Even for the Mongols, that's far too quick. They spent, again, they spent 70 years to take all of China. When the first year they attack, the, for the first three years they're fighting in China, it's attack uh, again in the fall and then retreat in the summer and then resume warfare in the fall. To them, there is no doubt that Europe, the Hungarians, all of them are going to submit and be conquered in the future, but it's not going to happen by 1243. So what's the point in sending all these men to, to die? Just to confirm what you said there, um, with with a source uh, that kind of nicely reflects what you said. Um, John of Plano Carpini again, a friar sent by the Pope to Mongolia. He traveled with these Mongols and they eventually somehow they communicated with each other. And he tells the story of the Battle of Muhi from the Mongol side, if you can believe it. If you believe he's not twisting their version. And what he says was they were close to fleeing at the Battle of Muhi. Batu uh, pulled out his sword at one point to stop the retreat of the Mongols. And this kind of thing is implied in the Asian sources, that there was, they wanted out um, during the battle or around the time of the battle and Subutai had to stop them. But in this story, it's Batu. And I don't think we have to doubt this story necessarily. And apparently Batu pulled his sword out and he said, let's just stay here and if we're going to die, let's die here. Because Chinggis Khan prophesied that we were destined someday to be annihilated. So if today is that day, let's just go out with a, a bang. Now, it's very weird for Carpini to have made that up or something. And I'll just tell you why I think. One reason I think that would be weird to make up. Is that it kind of makes the Mongols look really good. <laughs> There's a heroic element to that saying. That it's almost um, like those sort of epos poems of the Central Asian hero or something. Like, he faces this with courage and he says, if this is the day, 
Let's let's die heroically. And he stops the retreat. And this is a hated, evil individual from the Pope's point of view, from the Papal Curious, who's killed millions of Christians, or I don't know how many, thousands upon thousands of Christians and non-Christians, but especially the Christians would have been a problem for the Pope. Um, seemingly for no reason. Uh, they, they don't know why the Mongols are doing this. And it's an outrage. They think it's a it's an absolute outrage that they've killed all these people in Hungary. And this story makes him look heroic at that moment of near defeat. But doesn't that sum it up what this invasion of Europe was really like then, if it's true? If that story is true, that for the Mongols, on the Mongol side, it's a it's a panicky retreat, it's a narrow, it's it's fatal resignation that they might be dying here, that they're out in this salient deep in, in this strange part of the world called Europe, and that there's enemies on every side, and they're deep, deep into it. They've been abandoned by some of the most powerful princes, and now they're losing. Potentially, they're going to lose here, and they're all going to die. It's like, now, now I think that's a more realistic version of what the Mongol outlook was <laughs> at certain times in 1241-42 than this comic book story. Where they were never, they didn't break a sweat. They just clobbered everyone, and, and never, never was there a moment of self doubt that they were going to just win all fifty battles in a row. Because humans never experience self doubt. <laughs> well, even also on the point of Carpini there. So it's interesting that at such a similar portrayal to the Yuan Shu's account, where it's the commander having to sort of whip the princes back into shape to keep fighting. Now Carpini. And the Chinese authors, they did not communicate. They weren't, Carpini didn't read this Chinese source and go, okay, I'm going to write that. The Chinese authors didn't read Carpini's account and go, ah, that's a good story, but we'll put Subodai instead. No, they got it from the same source. Who's the same source in both cases? The only one connecting Europe and China? The Mongols. They both heard, this is both what's coming from the Mongol accounts. And the Mongol accounts of the Battle of Mui, of just of the Battle of Mui, let alone anything else, are of a botched crossing, uh, princes, parts of the army wanting to fall back, and the the commanding, the commanding officer, the commander, having to get them to stand their ground. And Subodai in, in, the, in the biography there goes, uh, like, I'll, I, I don't care, the rest of you can run, but I'll keep marching onto the, the Hungarians alone if I have to. You know, this... If, if it was, if, and again, these aren't the Chinese making this up to, to denigrate the Mongols. This is from the Mongolian military documents translated into Chinese and collected from the Yuan dynasty. If it was an easy, easy battle, the Mongols wouldn't be writing that. They'd be writing about how the Hungarians shattered before them. But instead, they're portraying it as sort of a heroic effort. That it's heroic on their part to have overcome such a fearsome enemy. Academic historians being like lawyers and very, you know, very slick, they might say, aha, but you see, you've, you've fallen for it. The Mongols portrayed it as this very desperate struggle in Hungary because they wanted the glory of their victory to shine all the brighter because it was so hard fought. And then all I would say to that, I don't, I, don't, I don't subscribe to that view. I'd say, well, then how come they didn't do that about every battle they won? How come some of them are easy? How come they specifically said about this battle it was one of the greatest deeds they ever did? Jubaini said this. One of the greatest battles, toughest battles they ever fought was Muhi. Uh, he was a contemporary insider of Karakorum, governor of Baghdad. Why would he, why would he give a shout out? Why would he give props to the Hungarians like that? What, what, what does he have to do with Hungarians? What, what does he want them to look good for? But here's a perfect metaphor of how scholars can fall into this fallacy when dealing with material like this. Um, Richard III of England, I like to bring him up. Shakespeare said he had a bunch back. He had some sort of disfigurement of the back. Modern historians, when they encounter these ac these accounts of Richard III having this disfigurement, before they found him, they found him a few years ago under a parking lot, but before they found him, they have no body of Richard III. And all they, 
And the debate is just, do you think this is true or not? And a lot of the, you know, historians were skeptical because they said, uh, people just didn't like Richard III and they thought he was morally repugnant. So they thought a, a physical, a physical deformity was a sign of a moral deformity. That's how medieval or early modern people looked at the world. So they just propagandized that he had a bunch back. But then they found him a few years ago, and sure enough, he had a severe scoliosis. Now, he may have been able to ride a horse and fight and all these things, but it was, it looks like a severe, noticeable spinal deformity. And what I would say now that the mystery is solved, and we have Richard III and we have him with the back problem, I'd say, well, if, if moral, if this is really about propaganda, because Richard III was a bad person. Why didn't they just accuse every king, every king you didn't like? Why didn't they say, oh, he's got a bunch back? If, if Matthew Paris, the chronicler, didn't like the Pope or the Emperor, why didn't he, why didn't he say, hey, you know, Frederick II's got a bunch back? You know, how come just Richard III? It's, well, now we know, because he did have a bunch back. <laughs> it's sort of, uh, to take this further, it's like, if, if the sources keep saying that the Hungarian battle was desperate, and the campaign was desperate. If the Asian and European sources alike say this, the reason's probably because it was desperate and it was a hard fight. And it's not, we don't have to look into the minds of the writers about their agenda all the time and, and only see what we see as being a product of agendas. It's just not gonna further our understanding of history. No, no, it, it, exactly. It's, there's times when you should read more into something, but at a certain point, you have to wonder, okay, if all of these writers are saying this, how are every single one of them, even the ones who didn't, who weren't involved with the Mongols, how are they all lighting the Mongol propaganda? I mean, it's, it's not impossible, but at, at a certain point, you have to wonder, okay, if all of the sources are saying this, why why are we going to so much work to disregard them and put in a different narrative than what is in them? Yeah, well said. So, why I really buy into this theory too, that the Mongols saw this as just essentially a temporary strategic retreat, right? They, did, they didn't see uh, Europe as some unconquerable target. They saw that the army they had present in 1241 was insufficient to the task of completing the conquest of Europe. With And the Mongols just thought, okay, we fall back now and we will come back later with the proper army. And that's what we see from the Mongol European contacts over the following years is the Mongols keep sending letters demanding submission. Guya Khan is basically saying, to these Franciscan envoys, I am going to go there and finish the conquest. I'm going to bring a huge army, complete the conquest of the West, do this and that. And these things, these keep happening. And the, uh, the, the cons of the Golden Horde keep sending messages to the uh, Hungarian kings demanding that they submit. Uh, you mentioned uh, Guyuk's widow in the 12th, uh, end of the 1240s. She receives an embassy from the King of France and goes, ah, I've taken the submission of the King of France. Um, William of Rubric, during his journey, uh, he remarks that the um, Batu was so knowledgeable about, I think it's Batu, I think it's Rubric and Batu, but he remarks that Batu knew who the strongest uh, monarchs in Europe were. It was the, the King of France, the Pope and then the Emperor? Is that what he, the order he gave? He, yeah, the King of France and uh, the Emperor. And he said, the King of France is actually better than, stronger than the Emperor of Germany. Um, so, yeah, he, he took an interest. And I, I always thought that was funny that the, the Mongols actually took an interest in these people. Like, in this distant land, they start to learn who's who. And that might be a sign of Definitely, they still want to conquer them, but that might be a sign that they're taking them more seriously than just a rabble that's going to. They're be looking at subject. the strengths, what they're going to have to face, who they're going to be facing. 
Uh, and that's when sometimes you see people go, okay, the Mongols, they didn't conquer here because they thought it was so, so poor and didn't have anything they wanted and stuff. Well, first of all, the wealth of a region was not what made the Mongols conquer it or not in the first place. The belief was everything's going to be conquered. And second, they did see lots they liked in here. They liked the, the fabric work, as I already mentioned, the textiles and the metalworking. So the silver tree in Karakoram made by a, a Parisian goldsmith. Uh, and of course, in the sole reference to the people to, that Chagatai gives to the people in the western end of the continent in the secret history of the Mongols is a reference to the quality of their swords. Yeah, I, I think the Mongols fully intended and fully believed that they were going to come back and conquer Europe. They did not see anything in Europe that they saw, this is a target we cannot yeah, their, their later messages in the 1400s can confirm, or in the 1240s, later 1240s, after they invaded and withdrew from Hungary, their messages to Europe confirm two, two points you've raised really well. One, they did plan to conquer them still, because they're still threatening Europe. Surrender or die. And they, they meant it. Their, their threats are going to lose all meaning if the Mongols don't enforce those threats. And that's dangerous for their whole for their lives because then people lose respect for them so they if they said it they meant it i'm going to take their word for it they plan to come back to europe but secondly another point you raised and this just confirms it is that they even tried to rationalize with the europeans like the pope they tried to, and the king of france the top uh, rulers as they saw it they tried to rationalize with them that don't you see that if you surrendered it would be better it would be healthier for you, it would be good for world peace if all people were under one banner together. Can't you, can't you see how much better that would be <laughs> uh, to avoid the war? But just think about it, think of the harmony of the whole of Eurasia under one government. Um, and it confirms what you said, that they, they, they wanted Europe to submit, they needed it to submit, but they were not looking forward to that battle anytime soon, um, which goes to show you it was a, it was a it was a, a, a brutal war. Mm -hmm. I so the Mongols were under the belief that if they brought sufficient troops and had sufficient support, then they would conquer. Europe. If imagine if a hundred thousand troops had bordered had reached the edge of Europe and advanced like all together. How, how different that would, essentially doubling the amount of troops who've been present in 1241. And look at the damage that happened in 1241. So obviously we have these castles and cities holding out in, uh, in 1240, 1242 there. But imagine now the Mongols didn't have to worry about their, their rear, for example, because now there's just Mongol troops everywhere. If now, okay, now we can spend the time to take, then choke out these major points you end up with a different siege. You end up with, and what we see in later examples, the Mongols go, hmm, we didn't have the, the right tools, the right siege machines for this job, so now we're going to basically scour the empire for the right, right technology. Like, they would, if they put the political and military will to, will to it, I don't doubt that they would have found a means to, to conquer, to conquer you. It's well said. They were it, kind of leaving it to the end. Yeah, and, I mean, um, and it's for the far. It's the far western part of the continent. It's just the reality of the position. It's going to end up kind of uh, taking second or third place compared to things closer to home, like the the Song Dynasty, for example. So that is the reassessment so if, in fact it is partly then or partly mostly uh military necessity the short term the mongols realized that in 1241 1242 sorry the army they had would not have been capable of continuing to fighting and conquer all of europe but they certainly imagined that they had the capability to conquer Europe and fully intended to return and do so the way history ended up sort of unfolding is that they didn't. If Europe had been geographically closer to Mongolia, 
easier for them to attack. Maybe maybe we'd be uh, speaking a little different here, but we find it insufficient to ascribe the withdrawal in Europe to the death of Ogadai Han, to immediate environmental and ecological reasons, or to any inherent European military or defensive or offensive strength or quality of armor or what have you. Essentially, a force that was too small to get the job done was sent in the 1240s. The Mongols made this realization and pulled those troops out and would have come back, but things went a little differently. A lot of princes and cons drank themselves to early deaths, and that did a lot to help uh, any region on the extremity of the Mongol Empire. So that is my takeaway from this. Stephen, do you have any closing statements, thoughts, suggestions for further reading? Yes, Jack. There is one thing I would like to add that what's surprising is that um, people reading about this and just, you know, reading the basic summary of this story, they might be annoyed about being offered a revisionist take on it. But if you, if you engage with this consideration and consider that the story isn't so simple, then what you get, I think, is a, a fuller and deeper story and one that is supported by the, the materials from that time that have come down. Archaeology uh, and textual sources and all kinds. Numismatics, every kind of material seems to be feeding into a more complex picture of the Mongol relationship to Europe. And like you said, it was just a conquest that didn't quite get finished before the empire ended. Um, there were a lot of people who believed that they should just try to hold out until the Mongol empire flies apart. Cent centrifugal forces just rip it apart like so many other steppe nations. And what's shocking is that this empire stayed together, but even when it broke apart, it it lasted in these Khanates like the Golden Horde and the Yuan and the Ilhanate and the Chagatai dynasty that then bequeathed lasting influences over the entire world that exists to today. Um, and so it really is a story that I'm sometimes surprised Hollywood or Netflix hasn't hasn't jumped on because uh, they haven't fully explored this Mongol history because it really is one of the more amazing times you're ever going to read about in, in the history books, including the invasion of Europe. Well, they did do uh, the Rising Hawk. Did you see that? It's, no. Uh, Ukrainian. <laughs> don't don't watch it. Uh, Ukrainian movie about the invasion of Europe. Uh, it's not very good. So maybe it's better if they don't touch it. Because although they could touch it, and then I'll do a bunch of reviews about, wow, look how bad this show is. And I don't know. So that's that. That's our talk about the theories regarding the Mongol withdrawal from Hungary. I'm excited to see the comments from people who missed the point and are now accusing us of being Eurocentrist fascists or Mongol imperial supremacists and are now using this to argue that the Europeans were so tough and their armor was so good and just missed a point and now there's someone right now writing a comment about uh, European heavy cavalry chasing down the Mongols. I, I look forward to looking at it and glossing over it with my eyes. So that's that. Uh, if you've listened to all of this, however long this ends up being, thank you. Uh, you can hear us talk about it more on the Kings and Generals podcast, which came out last year. We also, I also wrote uh, a number of lengthy podcast episodes just in general on the Invasion of Europe, a four-part series. If you want to hear more detail just on the course of events, you can read more about it in uh, Stephen's chapter in the Routledge Handbook of South Central Europe, East Central Europe. It's, his chapter is called Mongol Inroads into Hungary. There will be a link to the page in the description or on screen right now. I'm not sure. Uh, again, I am not being paid to say that. That's just because Stephen wrote it, and I'm suggesting you can you can check it out. 
So And I do hope someday to turn Conquest and Withdrawal, my dissertation, into a book. If anyone is patient enough, you'll get the whole book version of this and you can read and decide for yourself if this is just the ravings of a crackpot lunatic or if there's actually some merit to this idea. And I'll give you a, I'll give you a spoiler. It's the former. <laughs> Good. Well, that that's what they'll put on on the tag the tagline on the book. It'll be like some raving lunatics conquest and withdrawal. Be a bit of a fun one to cite. Thank you all for listening. I'm the Jackmeister. Mongol history. Just call me Jack. It's fine. Thank you, Stephen, for coming on, giving us so much of your time. Well, thank you for having me. It was really a, a pleasure. I I hope we have. Uh, opened your mind a bit, maybe gotten you to think a bit about the Mongols and the invasion of Europe and open to the historical method. Or maybe we just wasted your time. Who knows? Either option's fine, mind. Alright. Ciao.